My name is Jonathan Eder. I'm from New Jersey originally. I came here in around 1990. And I started playing piano when, when I was about eight years old. My mother started me and my father also loved music. And uh, I started learning piano like most kids do. And I discovered a wonderful teacher, jazz piano teacher, which was very stimulating and very exciting for me. And that's when I got involved at about 12 or 13. And after that, uh, I went on to college to study music, and I studied music at William Patterson College in Manhattan School of Music, and went on to uh, play with a number of uh, big bands, uh, and uh, uh, traveled quite a bit playing. And then uh, after college, I moved out to Oregon in around 1990, and uh, happened upon a wonderful piano store and set up my studio there and learned quite a bit about pianos and uh, most pianists strangely enough don't know very much about pianos because it's a very complicated instrument and it's quite mysterious and it takes uh, a trained professional to understand how to even build it let alone maintain it and there are many sub-specializations of that and I became very interested in recording as well and usually when pianists play and record they end up having bad pianos so at some point you have to take matters into your own hands and, and, and try to learn a little bit about the instrument. Um, it's also difficult enough to play the piano, but if you're playing a piano that's in disrepair, uh, it's very unpleasant. And in some cases it can actually lead to, to injury when you're trying to force something out of the piano that you just can't get or it's not going give, to give back to you. Uh, especially if you're serious and you're practicing six hours a day or eight hours a day. So um, I, uh, I started restoring pianos myself, and this particular instrument I'm sitting in front of is maybe my favorite instrument of all. It's, it's made by a company called Mason Hamlin, and it was built in 1916. Uh, the company itself actually went out of business around 1929, like most of the great piano companies. Uh, about the turn of the century, turn of the last century, there were about 400 piano companies, just like there were many car manufacturers. And around the Great Depression, around 1929, many of these companies went out of business. They merged and consolidated. But there was um, a tremendous uh, boon in the production of pianos. And it was almost like television. Every home had a, a piano of, of some kind. And they were beautiful. They were beautiful works of art. And they also sounded uh, tremendously wonderful. Uh, the instruments that are made today are very, very different than the ones that were made 100 years ago. And I describe modern instruments almost sounding like electric pianos. So they almost feel and play and sound like electric pianos, partly because I think that's the way we expect things to sound. Um, it becomes increasingly difficult to interest people in pianos that sound like instruments that were maybe built in the 1920s or 30s or, or 40s. And that just has something to do with, with our culture. Um, and so I feel that it was almost a calling that I had to find these instruments and resurrect them, if you will, from, from the ashes. So when I find an, an old piano, and usually it's in someone's garage or someone's basement, and it's at, at the point where it's almost an environmental hazard, and you have to really clean it from stem to stern, um, but it's like being on an archaeological dig in a sense. It's like you're going into an ancient pyramid and you're looking for some type of mysterious uh, uh, artifact. But the artifact that you actually get once the project is completed is you get to hear the piano and you get to hear this beautiful tone. And it's, it's very special and it's something that we really don't hear very much of anymore. Think of uh, old violins as being special. Um, there are string instruments and cellos that are uh, hundreds of years old, sometimes two, three hundred years old. But we don't really think of pianos as being special when they're older. We usually think of them as maybe not being so great. Um, uh, new pianos are generally thought of as better, nice shiny pianos, but um, the, the, the whole concept of tone was very, very different. And to a musician, that's a very fundamental part of making music. When you learn to play violin or you learn to play clarinet or flute, the first thing you really do before you do anything else is you, you learn to create a tone. And that could take years to make a beautiful sound on an instrument. Even just to play a few simple notes is very, very difficult because you have to imagine 
what that sound is like in your head. Well, the piano is a little bit easier because almost anyone can push down a key and make a sound, and the sound is fairly acceptable. Sometimes it's quite nice, really. Um, but what you find is that over time, if you're serious about what you're doing, uh, you come to a point where, as a pianist, the music really doesn't sound quite right if you haven't been paying attention to all of the things that the other instruments have been paying attention to. And one of those things is tone production. So what makes a beautiful tone? Well, that's a very subjective question, but it's part of my job also as a teacher and someone that restores pianos to be able to inculcate that into, into somebody. So I tell people that you know, the best reason to study music or to have a musical instrument or even have a piano for that matter is to uh, cultivate a sense of beauty, whatever that means. Um, it's a very mysterious thing, but it's very rewarding once you find it. It's the same reason why uh, in, the, in the age of computers and digital photography, for some reason, we still find the need to do oil paintings or sculptures. Um, we don't really get bothered by the brush strokes in the painting necessarily. We're not concerned with the artifacts or the um, unevenness of it. And it's the same with pianos. If you play an old piano, it's very different than a modern instrument. It's not always absolutely perfect and pristine. Um, but on the, the flip side, you get a lot to work with. There's a lot that uh, is left to the musician to create. And in my opinion, modern instruments tend to be very limiting. They tend to um, have a very impressive sound in the beginning, but you don't really have anywhere to go with your imagination. And that can be very off-putting for people sometimes when they're, when they're playing an older instrument because you're not really necessarily getting back right away what you'd get back from a modern instrument. But over the course of time, over the course of months or years, uh, it actually it actually gives back much much more, and so uh, um, restoring old pianos to me is just part and parcel of being a, a pianist and being a musician and just having fun. I mean, it's just tremendous fun to find old instruments, and I've met all kinds of interesting people along the way, and they all have stories, and the pianos all have stories. Sometimes you find interesting things inside them, you know, photos and baseball cards and coins from a hundred years ago. Uh, pianos are repositories for all kinds of interesting knickknacks and sometimes things that aren't so interesting, sometimes the things that are a little scary, sometimes you find a, an old mouse in it or a, uh, bugs, but for the most part um, what, you, what you see is uh, an ethic, uh, a work ethic that really has been lost um, and if you, if you look at photographs of these old piano factories, they were monstrous. I mean, they were just these huge buildings and uh, uh, they, they employed hundreds of people along the way. So um, I hope that tells you a little bit about myself and uh, about uh, pianos and why I think they're so special. So let me show you some of the things that I look for in an instrument when I'm going to restore it. And probably the first thing I'm going to look at is who the maker is. There were about 400 at uh, the turn of the last century. And this one's made by A.B. Chase. A.B. Chase was one of the top manufacturers, along with Steinway, Baldwin, Chickering, Kanabi, Mason Hamlin. Um, and A.B. Chase happens to be one of my favorite pianos. I've, I've owned many of these. So um, the piano opens up. Uh, you lift the top lid. There are two fasteners on either end. And this lid comes off and it reveals the inner workings of the piano, which is called the piano action. So when I'm looking at a piano, I'm looking at the first thing is, can the piano stay in tune? And I'm looking at all of these called tuning pins. So the tuning pins go into a piece of wood called the pin block, and they have to be tight and they have to be consistent. And if they're tight and consistent, you got a pretty good start right there. The pin block's usually made of a, a laminate of hard rock maple. and uh, then I look at the hammers, and the hammers are what produce the tone on the piano along with the string. So you depress a key, it brings a hammer towards a string, the string vibrates, and you get a tone. The felt that was used in these old hammers uh, was very special. Uh, the felt that's used today is very different. So when a piano has original hammers, I try to keep it. Just like uh, an old violin, you don't want to go refinishing an old violin, and it's the same with 
with hammers. They need to be nicely shaped, nicely rounded. You don't want grooves in it. You don't want them to be too hard or too soft. And so I make sure that the piano uh, hammers are shaped properly. Um, I also look at these little felt pieces on the strings here. When you, again, when you depress a key, a little piece of felt comes off the string, and that's called a damper. And the damper uh, allows the string to vibrate. You lift the key, and the string stops vibrating. All of those need to be working properly. Um, if I play a chord of the piano, and when I lift the chord, I want the sound to stop. Um, the right pedal on the piano also lifts those dampers, so it allows all of the strings to vibrate. And when I lift the damper pedal, I want it all to stop. And on an older piano that's in disrepair, that's not going to happen. Um, I want the tone to be very even. All the way up and down, very consistent. There are many, many little parts, too many to name inside right now, but most of them are made of wood or felt or sometimes metal. Uh, and some of the obvious things that I replace are these little straps here. These are called bridle straps. Um, there's pieces of felt here, and there's pieces of little leather here that will be replaced. Um, also, uh, uh, the strings themselves, you want to make sure there's no corrosion on the strings. Some of that can be removed sometimes. Um, but in terms of this, the action of the piano, that's where I start. So let me show you what's underneath the piano. There's a little latch here that releases this panel, and the bottom of the piano can be viewed. You can see how the strings continue down to the bottom of the piano. The long strings are for the low notes, and the short metal strings are for the high notes. You have a bridge, just like on a violin or a guitar. There's actually two, and the strings go over the bridge and vibrate and transfer the sound into the soundboard. And the soundboard is this big piece of wood like the head on a drum. And years ago, they used beautiful old growth spruce that made a very beautiful tone. You also have what's called trap work down here where all the pedals work. And generally speaking, I'll take all of this out. I'll actually take the piano and incline and put it on its back and remove the bottom panel and make sure that everything's functioning properly there. These are things that by and large, people really aren't doing anymore. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a bit sad. Um, that actually started probably um, after the, the Second World War. A lot of that uh, technology was lost. Probably about a third of pianos are made in China now. So it's rarer and rarer to find old instruments. And uh, I'm probably one of the last people that's actually doing this kind of work now. Oregon happens to be a fantastic area for old pianos because we have constant temperature and humidity. Uh, so you don't have the extremes that otherwise would cause damage to a piano, expansion and contraction and cracking. Um, but it's rare and rarer to find these, these kinds of pianos, and it's rare still to find people that can work on them. So let's listen to a beautiful upright piano that's been completely restored by me. My name's Jonathan Eder. Thanks for watching.